now it's my distinct pleasure, I was told about five minutes ago, um, to introduce Jim Allison. Um, so let me just say a couple of words about Jim before he comes up. So Jim is, uh, is known by, by everybody, I think, because he actually developed drugs which are saving people's lives. That is the immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, Jim started his career, I hope I'm gonna get this right, Jim, you can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. But as I recall, started his career at MD Anderson, um, and, but not really at MD Anderson, at MD Anderson uh, Satellite Station, um, where there was really nothing to do. I mean, made Gui Lin look like a hot spot. So Jim, Jim was uh, out there where he could work, just work. There was no other call on time. And he, and he worked, and he worked on, this, on, the, on these ideas of his about why our immune system doesn't eat us. You know, why, why should our immune system not attack us? That's really the question. And if it's not gonna attack us, it can't attack tumors either, obviously. So if you can understand that, maybe you can unleash it. That was, that was the idea. And he went from, he went from MD Anderson um, in Smithville, the, this little place, uh, to Berkeley. Now I can imagine the political uh, differences between these two places. Uh, went to Berkeley, became chairman of a department, um, stayed there for a long time, gained an international reputation, and then moved to Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York to be closer to clinical, uh, to clinical um, care and, and access to, patient, to patients. He stayed at, MD, uh, at, at Memorial Sloan Kettering for a long time uh, where he really developed this, this idea of being able to interfere with uh, the, the interaction between or the non-interaction between uh, normal cells and, and immune cells. And then a few years ago moved back to MD Anderson where he is now and he um, is professor and chair of immunology and he's also, he's also now the senior scientist of MD Anderson in, in general. I don't know what he calls it, advisor or something like that. Um, which means what Jim says goes. Um, but before he comes up, one, one thing. So Jim is a great scientist, obviously. You're gonna hear that. He won the Nobel Prize for these discoveries that he's gonna tell you about. But that's not my favorite part about Jim. My favorite part about Jim is that he's a professional level harmonica player. It's true. And he plays, he plays with Willie Nelson. So, in fact, he was uh, with Willie Nelson a couple of weeks ago, and uh, yeah, I'll let him tell you about that if he wants to. But anyway, so let's, let's welcome uh, Jim Allison uh, to the stage. It's really great to have you, Jim. Thank you, Webb. Uh, I could add a few stories involving wine too, but I think I'll skip it this this, this time of day. And the, the uh, accounts of my early days are, are, are pretty close. Um, I moved back uh, from Burke. I moved to I should say to Smithville, not just to work at a place where there was so little oversight. Nobody knew, forgot we were out there and could do whatever we wanted. But also because it was close to Austin at the time, and I could go back and hang out the music scene and everything and have a good time while I was working. So it was work, play, work, play, work, play all the time. And uh, very, very hard at both, I think, uh, at the time. Anyway, what I'd like to do today is, is uh, um, really uh, talk about um, a little bit of a historical view of where checkpoint blockade came from, but mostly to talk about the mechanisms. of so there's a tendency these days to think, well, we got two checkpoints, you know, PD-1 and CTLA-4 based, and, and you know one has fewer side effects than the other, so let's use it. But biologically, these are really distinct molecules. They have you know, very different impacts. They work at different points in the immune response. They have very different impacts, and I think it's important to understand that. Uh, there's my disclosure. You can go ahead to the next, next slide. Anyway, uh, so I want to talk about that a little bit, and, and along the way, I'll try to intersperse it. One of the things I'd really like to talk about, and I'm sorry that Pam Sharma couldn't be here today because um, a, a lot of what we're doing now, partially based on the information we get there, is to develop a, what I think I've talked to some of you about, uh, about a, a new way of, of 
uh, early development of drugs to de-risk them and make sure that the trials that are done are done uh, on a rational basis based on data and mechanisms rather than just, you know, who owns what and, and that sort of thing. So the next slide, uh, really, let's see, I think the next slide, can, so I want to always thank uh, Max Cromwell, who was a graduate student lab, both uh, showed that CTLA-4 was a negative regulator than a positive one, which everybody thought at the time, but also uh, was in the early ideas of how to do it in cancer. Alan Corman, who was a colleague and friend and, and uh, uh, helped us develop the ipilimumab antibody. Uh, with, and the data I'm going to show you today was largely developed by uh, three postdocs, Spencer Way, Stephen Mock, and Narveen Sharma. And um, anyway, there's the funding. So uh, if I could have the next slide, I'll just start with uh, the way it works. And this is a, you know, none of this was known when, when I started at Smithville. And we figured all this out step by step. But basically, T cells, you know, have an antigen receptor, but uh, we worked that out in the early 80s, but quickly realized that the work of many, many labs, particularly the NIH, showing that, that there was another signal, a co-stimulatory signal was required. And T cells had to get them both at the same time. Um, late 80s, we showed that the receptor for those signals on T cells was a molecule called CD28. And anyway, the cartoon shows what happens after you get the T cell gets both those signals, you turn on all this stuff, you start dividing, because you know, you've got somewhere 10 to the 10th different T cells, so a small number of each one, you've got to expand that cell. And so when you get through those two signals, the T cells start dividing, generating the army that's needed. Um, and we also, along that time, when we, when we cloned CD28 and looked at it, we found that there was another molecule that had already been cloned called CTLA-4. Anyway, it was shown by others to bind to the same ligands, B7 molecules, which are found on dendritic cells. Um, it found the same ones. Anyway, it turns out that after the T cell expands, uh, one of the things, early events, is to turn on that gene, the CTLA-4 gene. It makes proteins that accumulates with time and uh, begins to compete, we think. Uh, with CD28 for the ligands, it has about four logs of magnitude higher avidity for the ligands than CD28 does, and we think it just shuts it off. Um, and the ro its role, its main role, is to stop that proliferative phase, because if you knock it out, as Tac Mac did and Arlene Sharp and, um, in my lab, um, Cynthia Chambers in my lab, mice die when they're about three weeks old. They fill up with T cells because they can't stop dividing. So, so, so that's what, it, what its main job is, but as I'll show you, it's a little bit more complex than that because it's a gradual thing. It gets turned on the instant the T cell gets activated, and so it can serve as a res stat because the amounts change and it's competing with CD28 after a while. The next slide just shows what happens with, and what the situation is with cancer because it was known from the early work at the NIH that solid tumor cells were not very good at providing co-stimulatory signals. And so after the ligands were identified, we put B7, the ligand for CD28, into a number of mouse tumor cells. Uh, at the time, the debate was, oh, mouse tumor cells are so much like regular cells, there's no way you can get uh, an immune response that's going to work. You know, it's impossible. They're too, too close to, which is, you know, pretty silly, actually. I mean, uh, immune system can tell a single amino acid change, obviously. Uh, and that's known. So why you have to have a rat cell or something before the immune system sees it is absurd. But in any, any event, uh, what we found, though, is all we need to do is put B7 in tumors, and they got rejected. So they have antigens. You know, that's not the issue. The issue is they're invisible to the immune system. And so they, the only way they can start an immune system is by a cross-priming event. When the tumor cells die, cause some inflammation, these cells of the innate immune system come in, pick up the tumor bits, and then present them to, to naive T cells via CD28 you know, ligands in the context of those, and they get everything started. But again, CD28 is hardwired. CTLA-4 is hardwired. It's going to stop it. And so the tumors had a head start, we argued, or the, the thoughts were, and, and so you know, it gets to grow for a while unhindered because it's invisible to the immune system until this process occurs. So I had the idea that you just uh, block C C to like four, you could keep the response going as long as you want. And so next slide shows one of the early animal experiments we did, uh, transplantable tumor growing. Um, if you block CD28, thank you. If you block CD28, uh, the tumor actually grows, grows faster, as you can see here. I can't see it. Anyway. Um, but if you injected CTLA, injected CTLA-4 antibodies, the tumor grows for a while and then goes away, and the mice are permanently immune for the rest of their lives to rechallenge with that same tumor. 
And so this, of course, was exciting. We, we, we did many, many animal models and different strains, different tumors. And basically, tumors came in two forms, those which could be rejected by monotherapy with CTLA-4 and those which we'd have to add chemotherapy or a vaccine or something else to, to cure them. But we could cure virtually any uh, transplantable tumor line that, that we looked at. And so, in any event, uh, work, it took a while to convince anybody uh, that, that this would work. But after about four years of trying, I finally Alan helped uh, meet somebody, uh, Niels Lundberg at, at Metarex, who had mice that had the immune the antibody genes replaced with humans so we could make a human antibody. And so we made ipilimumab. The next slide uh, just shows finally it got into, it was done in small trials by Metarex um, in many kinds of cancers, and there were responses in almost everything that it was tried in, uh, focused on melanoma. Um, and this is the clinical trial started. It was uh, published in 2010. Uh, it took about five years to do that trial because um, what we understood from the biology was progression-free survival. And I showed you in the mouse experiment, the tumors always grow before they go away, partially because it takes the immune system a while to do something. So progression-free survival is not an appropriate endpoint for this sort of therapy. Uh, the trial started that way, um, and anyway, before they finished it, they changed, you know, the uh, end point after, you know, my nudging them several times you know, to overall survival. So the, two, the trial took almost five years. Uh, but that, those are the results. The dotted line is the ipilimumab uh, only arm. The bottom line is the placebo. Of course, at that time, in 2011, there was no state of standard of care for melanoma, so it was a placebo control. And what you can see is the median survival has moved over about four months, so that would have been enough for approval. Uh, but the cool thing was that the survival care flattened out at about two and a half, three years and stayed there for the duration of, this, of, the, of the trial. And it was approved by um, the FDA in 2011, um, the beginning of a, a lot of approvals of this. But by about 2016, so there had been so much, actually, but yeah, about then. There had been so many trials earlier. There was 5,000 patients worth of data and, and uh, cumulative for which there was 10 years follow-up. And 22% of patients overall that received um, anacetylate 4 were alive 10 years after the end of treatment. So it's a curative treatment um, for some patients, not all. And of course, the question is, why not all? Well, I could give you some mechanistic explanations. One is, you know, maybe there wasn't any priming going on while the antibody was there. Some other things, but of course, uh, you know, those are interesting but kind of boring. The other possibility was maybe there are the checkpoints because c 4 was the first cell intrinsic molecule that could downregulate immune responses found. Maybe there were others. I think the next slide uh, shows uh, the scheme for PD-1 molecule discovered by Tosco Honjo. Um, in the um, early 90s, uh, called Program Death One because he thought it played a role in negative selection of the thymus, but he teamed up with Arlene Sharp and Gordon Freeman at the Dana Farber, and uh, they showed that it's another checkpoint. It's different from C4. It's 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 loosely related genetically, homologous, but um, it's different in a couple of regards. One is uh, its its ligand is expressed on tumor cells themselves, and the other thing is it's not expressed on naive uh, unactivated cells, it's, it comes up after activation, but more slowly than c 4 for example. Uh, and it works on, apparently works mostly on fully differentiated effector cells. Uh, and the way it works is the tumor's developed a defense mechanism. The T cell with specificity for a tumor comes, sees it, starts making gamma interferon, the tumor responds uh, by the gamma interferon upregulating PDL1, the ligand, which then turns the T cell off. So it's a defense mechanism that's, that's uh, acquired by the tumor cells. That pathway plays a role in protecting the fetus against maternal destruction uh, by T cells against paternally encoded antigen. So it's probably, that's probably its original role, but tumors have co-opted that mechanism to protect themselves against tumors. But again, it's an adaptive mechanism. So Suzanne Topalian uh, led a, next slide, 
just shows a summary of the launch phase one trial that she did. Again, react reactivity with uh, our, our clinical effects gets a, a large number of tumors, uh, notably not uh, castrate-resistant prostate cancer, which did respond to CTLA-4. And I don't have time to talk about it today, but um, Pam Sharma figured out why that was, and I'll, I'll mention it, that a little bit later on. Um, anyway, um, so that was quickly a, a, approved by 2014, I think. And then uh, the next slide just shows that um, that uh, when you put them together, you know, again, CTLA-4 works during early priming. PD-1 works on effective T cells and mechanisms in their different molecules, so different pathways. So put them together. We did that in my lab. Uh, Michael Curran did that as a postdoc at Animal Models, showed they're at least additive. And this is a trial that was started by uh, Jed Walchuk and colleagues. This shows the five years now. This is, child is out eight and a half years now, I think, with essentially the same result. But the, the, uh, about 55% or so of those patients um, are still alive at eight years or so after, after treatment. So again, they can be considered cured. So here with, uh, you know, this combination therapy, we've gone from melanoma, which there no drug had ever before uh, prolonged survival at all, to having, you know, better than half of the patients that we can cure now. And so a pretty exciting thing, you know, but of course the question is why not everybody, you know, why isn't it 100%? And also, you know, meta this, this is a late stage melanoma, lethal disease, but it's only about 15% or so of, of total melanoma. and so. Um, you know, it's a, in terms of number of patients, it's not that huge a thing. So, you know, this looks great, and it is, but we got a lot of work to do. Next slide just shows, uh, um, next slide, please. Um, a, a slide that I got from a publication. This just shows time versus the approvals. And this looks pretty impressive with all these different approvals, but it's worth pointing out that the majority of these are with various PD-1 antibodies, which I think are probably all functionally equivalent, our um, CTLA-4, our combinations, and all of these here are, uh, well, almost all of them are in late-stage cancer. So this is, um, you know, based on, uh, you know, it look, looks impressive, but I point out, I could name to you about eight molecules for which there's sufficient preclinical data to suggest that they could have data like this. And yet, not a single one of them has gotten has been approved yet, except um, um, LAG3, which was approved last year in combination with, with PD-1. Uh, but so now, everything else is CTLA-4 or PD-1, vast majority PD-1. Why aren't those other ones being moved in? And I can talk about that later. I'm not going to spend time now, but it's a shame. Uh, and also, most of these are in late-stage disease. So the next slide. Um, just shows that one of the things that became evident is that there's a core, different kinds of cancers, everybody knows, especially um, um, unapologetic geneticists, that, that uh, there's a relationship here between tumor, uh, overall tumor uh, mutational load in the tumors and responsive. The ones that have the most tumors, the most mutations, respond to monotherapy even with CTLA-4 or PD-1. Those with fewer mutations and respond less well, and that's because there are more shots on goal, obviously. Um, any mutation uh, that creates uh, a new a mutant peptide that can bind to HLAs will be a target. Um, and so one of the things that, you know, sometimes I start the talks with is, is the, you know, the, classically, you know, you, the, the only tumors that, the only mutations that mattered were the drivers. I remember having discussions with Harold Varmus when I was at Sloan Kettering, and he was really disappointed when Bert Vogelstein's first paper came out on colorectal carcinoma when there were so few drivers and so much junk. And, uh, you know, so, you know, I, he showed me that paper uh, before it was published. Bert had sent it to him. So I, I, I called Bert about that junk and said, could you send me the sequences? And so we, a fellow in my lab ran them through MHC binding programs. We found out about 40 t possible targets per cell uh, are generated by that junk, you know. So the passenger mutations are not just passengers. They're actually serving as potential targets. And explains why these tumors that are like melanoma that become genomically unstable have so much change in multiple drivers in the population that are so vexing to approaches to do so-called precision medicine or sitting ducks for the immune system because that also generates, you know, more, more targets for that. 
Anyway, uh, other but on this on this slide, you can see that other tumors uh, do as well, less well. Except when you get down here, you can see the red boxes here. Kidney also responds quite well, even though it really is down in that range where it ought not to really, but it does. And this is a curiosity that there's a lot to. Prostate actually is even colder, both respect to mutations and if you look at it for infiltration, it's colder than pancreatic cancer, and yet it responds to anacetylate 4 and, and not to PD-1 as monotherapies. And I don't have time to talk about that a little bit. I'll mention it in a minute. But then, of course, uh, glioblastoma is on there and pancreatic cancer and, you know, things that don't respond yet. So the next slide just shows, uh, I believe this is, again, showing the relationship between responses and mutational load on the right. Uh, but also on the left shows the frequency of tumors in the population. So if you do the math that they did in this paper, it works out that we're only getting about 20% of, of overall cancers in people now. And again, this we're mostly late stage and stuff. So we need to do a better job. And, and part of it is it was happening naturally. It's moving away from you know metastatic disease to earlier and earlier stuff. Uh, but also there's a lot of targets that we haven't exploited yet, and I think that, that's our big challenge now is to do something about that other 80% of people. Next slide just shows uh, um, that, that one way to do this is by neoadjuvant approaches where you combine the C-TLIP with so Pam Sharma, again, did the first neoadjuvant trial with checkpoints in 2006, five years before it was even approved by the FDA in bladder cancer. And um, I'll later talk about some of the, one of the things that we learned from um, analyzing the tissue that she got out of these patients at the time of surgery after being treated. Uh, but also she had three out of nine, I think, patients in that trial when they went to surgery. They, they got anacetylate 4 before they went to surgery. At the time of surgery, there was no tumor detectable. So they were pathologic complete responders. In bladder, and later on, that that uh, its efficacy in bladder cancer was confirmed with uh, larger trials. So, very useful. I just put this up as an example. There, are other stuff in uh, in um, lung, uh, some of which from uh, uh, the Hopkins group. Uh, but this is just to stick with melanoma for a minute. This is one by uh, Sapna Patel at, at Anderson. It was published in ESMO, as we're just showing in melanoma. Uh, neoadjuvant, where people are on uh, pembrolizumab either as an adjuvant or a neoadjuvant thing, you know, with surgery. In the middle of the next slide, I'll skip everything to just cut to the chase. In the neoadjuvant setting, there's 77% three year survivals. And so that's flat curve, and the chances are that's going to be continue to be flat. I mean, we don't know for sure. We'll see. But if, that's if you give it before, during, and after um, surgery. If you just do it after, you know, it's not nearly that effective. So it's very important to give this. But anyway, the, the use of these neoadjuvant trials is, is allowing us to go earlier cancers and also give us tissue to analyze. One of the things that we've learned that I've talked to some people about is some of the targets uh, that people have looked at and tried to get activity out of single agents are not even expressed at baseline in tumors. They're not expressed until you give the patients anti-CTLA-4 or you give them PD-1, then those pop up. So doing a single agent trial is a complete waste of time and, and leads to drugs being rejected that ought not to be. And you can find out that sort of stuff by this sort of trial and analyzing uh, the data. Anyway, been, there has been an approval in lung cancer of this sort of trial, uh, but uh, this will probably be approved pretty soon. I saw an update the other day of 300 patients, and it still uh, looks like this. So uh, next slide, uh, just to get to the meat of the talk now, is there's a comparison. We've got these two checkpoints, but they're very different. I mean, one of the things I showed you is that CTLA-4 is hardwired, targets the CD28 pathway. Uh, PD-1 um, is induced, at least in cancer, the ligand is induced on tumors to defend themselves, so it's not hardwired. You know, if you don't have CTLA-4, you, you're dead, you know, basically. There is no null mutation of CTLA-4 um, because it, T cells can't stop. Anyway, it's a little bit of controversy, but it seems that PD-1 also targets the TCR pathway. Because of the fact that it works during priming and that rare static effect, CTLA-4 actually blockade actually lowers the threshold of signal strength that T cells need to be activated. We showed that back in the 90s with model systems and 
in mice. So in cancer, it's been shown now that it actually increases clonal diversity um, by recruiting new cells, the lower morbidity cells in the immune response, both in animal models and in patients now, whereas PD-1 doesn't seem to do that. It, it, it can awaken clones that have responded before but have gotten turned off by that uh, pathway that I showed you it can immediately reawaken those, but there's really no evidence that it recruits whole cell uh, neoantigen to the response. Um, skip down. Um, CDLA4, as I'll show you, primarily affects CD4 cells. Uh, CD8, uh, um, um, at least from our data, PD1 is a monotherapy, affects only CD8 cells, although it's very different when you put them together, as I'll show you. Um, Pam Sharma showed that at least in bladder and, and sorry, at least in, in kidney, uh, sorry, uh, prostate and bladder cancer, PD-1 does not drive T cells in. Both of them, at least in the people where it's really cold, PD-1 does not drive T cells in, but NICTLA-4 does. And uh, actually we can get responses in patients used in prostate cancer driving the T cells in with NICTLA-4. Then they express PD-1 and PD-L1 all over the place. Then you add that antibody, and, and we've had some CRs there, but the toxicity is a problem with the combination of working on that. Anyway, um, again, at, the main thing is that adverse events, probably because of the mechanism of action of CTLA-4, um, are more frequent. Uh, they're less frequent. They're not that different, perhaps, overall, and the, the, the type of thing, but they're definitely much less frequent with PD-1 which is one of the reasons it's used so often. But one of the differences is that disease recurrence after response is pretty rare with CTLA-4. Uh, but with PD-1, it's pretty common, 25 to 35% from old data, you know, after three, three years or so in melanoma and in, and in lung, lung cancer. And, of course, as a consequence of, of that last thing, the toxicity and everything, CTLA-4 um, uh, can be given. CTLA-4 is usually given once or twice or a few times and stopped, whereas PD-1 is given all the time until a patient progresses or, or, or two years or so. Anyway, the next slide uh, just shows something that uh, we did and just quickly. I used to have to explain how CYTOF is, but I don't anymore. But anyway, we did looked at mouse models and in a few patients to identify the cells using these metal tags where we can look at 43 parameters at a time. And the, the next slide just shows uh, the schema, we did this, this is a um, MC38, this is a chemically induced colon carcinoma. It has, it's, it's got a lot of mutations and so very immunogenic. We did the same thing with a uh, cell line that's, for, that's a mouse uh, uh, melanoma. It has very few mutations and we can't treat with, with monotherapy. We have to use a vaccine or something with it. We've got the same results in both cases. Uh, the annotated data are shown here. Uh, the next slide, rather. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm not going to go through this. The up, down, arrows. We took account the weight of the tumor from individual mice, so we knew could associate changes with uh, uh, whether the tumor shrank or not. I'm going to disregard T. Regs because the, this antibody that we used in this experiment uh, depletes them. Uh, others don't. In humans, the ipilimumab does not deplete T. Regs. The rest of it's the same in both. So the next slide just uh, shows you what we found. Uh, CTLA-4, the cells that it hits, are a, a, a type of CD4. It's a Th1 cell uh, that, that makes gamma interferon and, and TNF-alpha, so it looks like a Th1, but it has ICOS on it, which is kind of unusual. And I'll come back to it in a minute, but Pam Sharma found those in her neoadjuvant trial in 2006. It was quite controversial at the time because well, for reasons I'll show you later. Uh, but it was a new kind of, of T cell. Uh, and also uh, these uh, uh, effector cells, sorry, CTLA-4, effector cells that have T-bet, uh, um, and so they're uh, recently terminally differentiated. Uh, they have a PD-1 on them, uh, but they are just what you'd call the effector CD8. Uh, and, and that's it, that's what CTLA-4 hits. But PD-1, if you look very carefully, what it does is hits those same effector cells, but also another population of cells that have LAG-3, PD-1, and TEM-3. You have three different 
um, inhibitory molecules on the surface. Also, a lot of other changes that result in what John Huary and others call exhausted. So these are cells that have been reacting for a while. They can still do things, uh, but they can't really divide very well. And then all that, that Functional because they have those three inhibitory molecules on them, but they expand when you give C when you give PD PD1 antibodies. But our work showed that they still have those that phenotype. So after the antibody goes away, they're going to stop again, which is probably why you have to keep giving PD1 because it only work until the antibody goes away. And then that because it doesn't change the cells, they've got an epigenetic change that lacks them in that population, or so it's thought, and you can't change it. So. Uh, that's the situation there. So we said, well, what happens when you put them together? We know that works much better. The next slide uh, just shows the data. Um, like, go ahead, the next slide uh, just shows uh, the question, what happens when you put them together? The next slide shows the uh, schema again. It's just a fourth group. The next slide uh, shows you uh, the results. Now this again, these are uh, the control antibody, antacetylophore, antipd one these are those exhausted cells, the PD-1 lag-3, TIM-3 high that PD-1 primarily works on, and a PD-1 primarily works on. If you add c 4 the green one shows that amplification. If you add c 4 the next slide, you see the number of those actually goes down. It doesn't go up anymore. It actually goes down, which is kind of, and because we know that that's good for the tumor. It's been, I mean, the number of those cells positively or negatively correlates with tumor size. So the number of those cells is associated with effectiveness when you treat uh, or when you don't treat. Anyway, this just shows the uh, correlation coefficient here, uh, either in controls or PD-1-treated mice. But when you add c 4 not only does the number go down, but uh, so the next slide, uh, they become irrelevant. So the numbers don't correlate anymore. So the picture completely change, changes when you add and I see clay four. So the next slide just shows uh, those effector cells. The effector cells go up more, even more, when you add C clay four. Uh, oh, sorry, these are the CD4 cells. That I didn't, I didn't point out the lines, but the effector cells also go up when you do the combination. But also the CD4 cells, which aren't affected by PD1, now they go up, which makes sense because the, these cells also turn on PD1 after they're um, um, uh, uh, made when they get activated. So anyway, the next slide just summarizes this and says um, that, that, you know, we went from uh, this situation uh, of, to just two cells mattering. Uh, the, the, those exhausted cells don't matter anymore. Everything is by an increase in CD4s, which is critical. You don't get the response without that. And the CD8 effectors are down. And so the question, the next slide is, you know, what, what, what happened? What happened to those exhausted cells? Um, there's, there's two possibilities. One, uh, the next slide, just is that uh, we reversed them and uh, reverted them to the original phenotype, which, uh, depending on who you talk about, uh, John Worry feels that that epigenetic change is irreversible. Uh, others that have studied that pathway, Andreas Schettinger, for example, feel that it's not so reversible. Um, the next possibility is that you know maybe we did reverse it, or what I think is more interesting is preventing it because when you've got C clay four around, all the T cells have ready access to PD one. I'm sorry to B seven CD twenty eight interactions and can get co stimulated, you know if the molecules are available. So that continued availability of co stimulation may prevent the exhaustion, which is an interesting thing clinically because maybe you don't need to give, uh, keep giving, you know the combination, you know, forever. Anyway, uh, let's just move on then. Uh, next slide. Uh, to those CD4s, temporarily, uh, very quickly. Um, these the CD4s with ICOS, when Pam found them, it was uh, very controversial because people before had only seen ICOS either on follicular T helper cells in, in the germinal centers or on uh, suppressor cells, and yet she found them with c 4 The next slide shows that uh, with anacetylate 4 treated animals. The next slide just summarizes some of the data. The clinical data, these went way up. Uh, the number of them, if you don't get those, you don't get a clinical response. Um, and Pam went on, there was other things about it, but Pam went on uh, to show that if you, uh, you, they play a role in the response. If you try to do acetylate 4 treatment in mice that lack ICOS or it's ligand, it doesn't work very well. 
And so these cells are an inherent component of it. So it's not just an epiphenomena. They are involved in a mechanism. So the next slide uh, just shows that, that you need them. That's, that shows the last ep of efficacy uh, in, in, in the absence of those interactions. The next slide, uh, basically, and I'll wrap up here in a minute, uh, we can target ICOS. We made a vaccine with ICOS ligand, gave it. The next slide shows uh, the, the experimental setup. If we use the antibody, CTLA-4, uh, with a vaccine that's just vanilla irradiated tumor cells, the red dashed line is what you get. But if you put ICOS ligand in those cells, it goes up to the blue line. So you go from about 20% efficacy to over 90 with just giving that signal. So there's a lot of interest now in, again, taking this finding and, and trying to find clinically ways of, of engaging ICOS. If you try it in ICOS knockout mice, it doesn't work. So you need the signaling, these pathways that are provided by that molecule. Uh, the next slide. Uh, shows, if you look at it, just, uh, you know, this is the last data slide, I'll slow, I guess. Just looking at the tumor microenvironment, uh, which we'll hear about in, in our last talk from, like, from our awardee this year, but this shows what happens to the, to the T cell population. Um, I, if you look, let me see if I can get this one. Anyway, if you look at this green thing down the lower right, sort of in the middle, uh, those are where the effector-like T cells are there. That population is greatly increased when you move to the right. Uh, but the exhausted cells, which are the yellow ones, just a little bit under that, they, they basically completely go away. So you end up with uh, these, these uh, CD8s now that are the ones that you really want to kill tumor cells. And if you look at the myeloid cells, it's even in more interesting. Next slide uh, just shows the myeloid cells. This is single cell RNA sequencing, by the way. These are the different myeloid clusters that you've got. And what you can see is this red pop, this blue population, well, let's look at the red population first. Those are, are largely, the top part of it anyway, um, are largely uh, suppressive cells that have a molecule called LILRB4, which makes them very suppressive. Those are gone uh, when you give this NSCLA4 plus the ICOS uh, agonist. Uh, and the shift to the blue population at the lower right, which are myeloid cells with INOS, and so are uh, inflammatory cells and can really help with the response. So this effect, we're only treating things on T cells, but the whole microenvironment shifts to accommodate those changes. And so uh, that, we think that's, that's of note, and it's probably because of the gamma interferon that is induced by those cells. So now let's just, uh, if I could run through, uh, just, I talk too much, but anyway, let's just skip the next slide. Uh, it's just a, some slides showing where uh, this just shows looking at knockouts very quickly, uh, analyzing knockouts uh, and looking where CD4 cells with ICOS are, and you, they're in that population way down at the bottom. So we haven't been just finished that data. We can't find those cells in PBMC by Cytop. We cannot find those cells in PBMC in humans are in mice, uh, in lymph nodes, or anywhere in a, in a mouse, in blood of mice uh, that, that are wild type. We can only find them if it's deleted or if you treat with anti-CTLA-4. And so it looks like the CTLA-4 is creating that population of cells that's going out. And we think it's doing it again by shifting the population uh, of CD4s during the priming where they get functionally committed and giving us this super TH1 that really doesn't exist normally to go out. So in the, this kind of treatment, you get those. And again, PD-1, there's nothing in a PD-1 treated, uh, a, a PD-1 knockout mice that's not there in the wild type. So again, that's a downstream thing that doesn't happen very early during development. But this is a consequence of the fact that CTLA-4 works very early. So if you mess with it, you can get new populations. Okay, let's just skip, uh, just, just skip the next one, the next one. Uh, this just shows that point. Next one, skip that, skip that. I was ambitious here, let's just keep going. <laughs> uh, well, at this point, I can make very quickly. This just shows memory. You, give a, 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 a radiated tumor cell down here you with, with, with CTLA-4 or PD-1, and you look at the response. Uh, the purple line is if you gave PD-1 back here, 
no treatment when you re-challenge two, three months later, so two and a, two and a half months. Uh, the red, the orange line shows what happens when you re-challenge the mice that were treated with NICTLA-4 back here, no treatment at all in this re-challenge. Uh, sorry, this, yes, the iron uh, line, but if, uh, that's the combination actually, but if you just do CTLA-4, it's the green line. So PD-1 does not contribute to memory. You know, these tumor cells accept a very little bit by itself. You get no memory. To test this better, next slide, uh, we did peptides, uh, small peptides. So tumors have nothing to do with this. We vaccinated early with the antibodies, then rechallenged later on. You can see the priming goes down. There's a strong memory response, stronger with CTLA-4. But one of the things we noticed, next slide, is that and it's known now through John Huerry and other people that that, that balance of memory, uh, and everything's demonstrated by the ratio of, of two transcription factors. One's called TOX, that's primarily found in effector cells. The other one's called TCF7, that's in memory-like cells. And you can see here that the cells that were induced with the presence of CTLA-4 have a lot more of the TCF1 or TCF7 uh, than the PD-1. And the PD-1s have more TOX. So this gave us a clue as to what might be going on. In the next slide, and again, last data slide, data slides are we got knockout mice or got got cree mice uh, from from uh, uh, and, and got knockout mice that had floxed tc7 or or tox and then repeated these experiments and so if we uh, knock out tox it doesn't make any difference to the memory response generated by ctla4 of course there wasn't any memory with pd1 so there's no difference there but tox doesn't matter to memory the next slide just shows that in the, in the CTLA-4-treated mice, uh, if you lose tox, you lose the memory. And so that's the molecular mechanism. CTLA-4 works very early and shifts the whole pattern of these transcription factors to favor the generation of memory cells that can regenerate and slowly redivide. PD-1 doesn't, and so that's why there's no memory when you treat with PD-1, which has implications, of course, as to the durability down the road although this has nothing to do with cancer. This is just the biological effect. Now, I'll just finish off by just, I think that's it. Next slide. Let's just skip that. There are other targets. And then again, let's go to the last ones. Next slide. So this, I'd like to close with this. This is what we've been doing for a long time in cancer research, treating a bunch of patients and see if we move the median survival. Uh, looks like that. Uh, with IPI, we know, since IPI, the next slide, uh, that we can move it over four months, case of melanoma, but also a fraction of the patients are cured. It goes on for decades, perhaps. And so I think that what we've got to concentrate now is not so much on the median, but on that tail. And we need to concentrate on raising that survival tail. And next slide, just size we can get it, as many kinds of cancer cells as we can get it. And the good news is we know it can be done. About, you know, we just need to work harder and through organizations like this one, funding research and getting people together to talk about it. I think we've got a chance because it's just a matter now, you know, the ice is broken. We know we can do this in some cancer. We need to figure out what the barriers are and get it from that 20% total cancer patients to where we're curing a lot more. And again, I'm very optimistic we can do that. And the last slide, I think, is a... Uh, Advertisement for this institute, we're talking of which that's the goal. So I'll stop. Sorry, I went a few minutes over.